good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Emiliano Gennardini speaking. I'm the account manager for Micronir in EMEA and LATA. Welcome to this webinar um, between the AVI and the uh, Chemometric Brain. For, uh, um, and we will discuss about solution for digital food quality control and certification. As you know, this is the first uh, uh, event of uh, our uh, uh, series. We already started two weeks ago with NIRLAB. Today we will have the interview with Chemometric Brain. And uh, in two weeks' time, we will have uh, uh, another event uh, in collaboration with ONE and afterward with Spectral Solution and with Quadra. You can find all uh, the list of scheduled events on our LinkedIn page. The today's agenda, apart from my very quick uh, welcome, we will uh, um, leave the stage to Steve Sachs that uh, will introduce you to the Micronear technology and the heart of the presentation will be the interview uh, that Steve will run uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Jeff Cars um, from Chemometric Brain and also the very interesting live demonstration that will be carried out by uh, Beatriz. Um, this part uh, will take roughly 30-35 minutes, uh, so we will have another 10-15 minutes at least for Q&A. Regarding the Q&A, I will kindly ask you to write your question in the chat windows. We saw that like this is a very efficient way to manage the Q&A section. And uh, our commitment is to reply as more as possible to all the questions directly live. And if we are not able, because we are too long or uh, the answer requires specific, uh, um, let's say, uh, meeting, we will uh, organize a specific dedicated activity for that. Let me introduce the today's presenter. Steve Sachs is uh, our product line manager. He's based in Santa Rosa. He has, uh, um, apart to be my guru uh, biker, uh, he has a PhD in optical science. And uh, he started his career working for 3M company and uh, he has been working in the AVI since uh, 2011. Jeff Carr is the Chief Growth Officer of uh, uh, Chemometric Brain. He's based in UK. Uh, he has uh, a Bachelor and a Master of Science in Geology and also an MBO. Uh, he has a long experience. Uh, he worked in different companies, Ernest Young, IBM, and, and Oracle. And he also worked in a lot of uh, new small companies uh, like Innovation and Imagineer. Beatriz Carrasco Gomez, uh, she is uh, since uh, um, the beginning of this year the CTO of Chemometric Brain. Uh, she uh, has a PhD in physical chemistry at the University of Murcia and also an honorary PhD in chemistry in the same university. She worked for a while in the Murcia University in, and, in, and she has already published 30 scientific art, art, articles. Starting, she started uh, in uh, 2001 working uh, in uh, in the beginning was a premium ingredient, afterward it became BlendUp, and uh, afterward is now Chemometric Brain. Maybe uh, Beatriz and, and Jeff, uh, they will uh, enlighten us uh, on uh, the relationship between uh, BlendUp and Chemometric Brain. But uh, as I promised, I want to be very uh, quick in this part, and I leave immediately a stage to, to Steve Sachs that will drive through the interview, but before the interview, a few uh, moments uh, on our product line. Thank you, Emiliano. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'll uh, talk very briefly about our company, uh, a little bit about our product line, and then we'll launch right into the subject of today's webinar. Uh, Biavi is uh, a, a U.S. publicly held corporation uh, of more than one billion U.S. dollars uh, in turnover. Uh, we operate globally in many countries and many different industries and market segments, so quite a diversified company. 
divided into two basic business units, network and service enablement and optical security and performance. Our product line and our business live in the optical security and performance section of the business. And uh, I won't uh, talk too much about our product uh, line overall, but we're all, all of our product lines are involved with the management and uh, measurement of light. So um, the Micronear instruments are based on a technology that was developed by Viabi many years ago, in fact, for NASA interplanetary spacecraft. Uh, the linear variable filter is a narrow bandpass filter where the wavelength depends on linear position on the filter. In the upper left, you see uh, a linear variable filter such as the one that is built into the Micronear instruments. Um, it is a very durable, um, uh, uh, physically robust um, uh, optical component and it can form a very lightweight and highly uh, reliable spectrometer. So the LVF is a uh, linear variable filter is built into a spectrometer by mating it with a, a linear array. And if you look over here on the right side, you can see <clears throat> the way the linear variable filter sends uh, each of an individual, each individual wavelength to a different element of the detector array. And in the upper part of the right figure, you see how a Micronear instrument is assembled with long-lived tungsten lamps for illumination, uh, collection optics, and then the detector assembly at the end of a, of a light guide. This makes uh, a very small lightweight component, uh, long-lived, and has no moving parts or free space optics. So there is literally nothing to realign or recalibrate uh, on the, uh, on the wavelength side. Uh, there are no wear components, so the instrument is also maintenance free. Largely insensitive to temperature, uh, and we've uh, built it into many different instruments. Um, and uh, this is a, a sample. We have a few more models, some uh, more recently introduced, but over on the left, uh, we call the golf ball, uh, is uh, a small uh, OEM instrument designed for uh, research use and uh, industrial applications. The on-site W is the instrument that we'll be talking about today. Uh, wireless, handheld, Bluetooth connected, very versatile instrument for use in the field and factory floor. And then over on the right, we have process monitoring instruments, both uh, wired and wireless. Uh, wireless being good for dynamic uh, blending equipment, for example. A little closer look at the on-site W, uh, very simple to use instrument, very ergonomic, uh, built more or less like a flashlight or a torch, as you say in England. Um, integrated lamps, uh, the optical engine is in the head, one button, one light, very lightweight uh, and easy to use. Bluetooth connects it to um, PCs or mobile devices very readily. An internal battery, which will operate uh, in many cases for um, many days or uh, weeks without uh, recharging, depending on how it's used, uh, the multifunction button and the LED. Uh, many of our customers, including Chemometric Brain, have used this instrument uh, to move NIR spectroscopy into new market areas and new applications. Uh, that have, uh, we believe, uh, significantly expanded the applicability of NIR spectroscopy. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Jeff Kars to join us. Good morning, Jeff. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello. Hi, Steve. Um, so, uh, Jeff, you have the uh, the featured spot today. So, why don't we please uh, begin by sharing your screen and just give us a very broad introduction to Chemometric Brain and uh, your offering. Thank you, Steve. So uh, I'm Jeff Cast, and Chemometric Brain was developed within a food company, Blendtub. <laughs> so Blendtub's a, a powder blending company. Um, over seven years, Beatrice, who's our CTO, developed Chemometric Brain initially for internal use within a food company. Um, and then more recently, we've now separated it out as a separate company, and now it's been used by food companies all around the world, and you'll see how they're using it in a second. There's a lot of research gone into this. Over, over seven years, it's been developed in conjunction with some research institutes. You know, it's, it's, it's been used to process hundreds of thousands of batches, 
hundreds of thousands of spectra. We have thousands of libraries that we've built and, and others that we've got access to. Um, and you know, it's, 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 pretty, it's widely de deployed in uh, people using it for powder, for liquids, for gels, for solids now. Um, and we're, at the moment, we're just going through an A-series fundraise. Um, it's, built in, it's built for the cloud, so anyone in the world can access it, uh, connect your devices to it, and, we'll, and, and it's built in the cloud, so, so we update it constantly, so customers receive a constant stream of innovation, of new algorithms, new processes, new methods um, that we deploy. So, so just moving on to the first slide, so in principle how it works is we have a, a, a VRB device, uh, obviously the spectra get downloaded, and that in itself is, is very straightforward. And then we start to process the data in a, in a number of different ways. Um, now, the, the, where this, this, this originated from was, was Beatrice having a, an epiphany, saying, hang on, we have this fantastic spectra, but we're not using it properly. We're, not, we're treating it to, to, to look at uh, some quantitative analysis, and those use cases have been around for 20, 30 years, nothing new in that. So Beatrice uh, gave up gaming on her Xbox and started gaming on spectra. And, and really get, understand how, how spectra can be analyzed in many different ways. Um, so we, we, in principle, we use, we use three different techniques. We absolutely do the quanti uh, quantitative analysis, again, it's been around for a while, but we can do it independent of any manufacturer's device. Um, so there's no need to go back to the, to the if, if you've got a, one of the, um, the, 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 uh, one, the devices that have been around for a long time, you, you don't need to go back to those manufacturers for any uh, calibration. A lot of the work we've done is around the qualitative models and qualitative analysis. I'm going to spend a bit of time on that and showing you some worked examples. And we've also built a lot of AI machine learning to determine the composition of final products uh, from a scan. So there's some really smart stuff that Beatrice has been doing over the past few years. As a consequence, you know, we can robustly identify raw materials to a high degree of confidence, any adulteration that can go that, that happens with it, and potentially what the what the adulterants are. We can look at, at, at suppliers and how they're performing and the consistency of their products. We can check things like product, homogene product homogeneity, um, and, we can, and I think we've got a short example on that. So we can analyze the, the, the ingredients and obviously determine the physical chemical characteristics. And at one level, this allows organizations to, or an individual to, at the simplest level, get a tick or a cross saying this, is, this batch is good, or there are some issues with it. And if there are some issues with it, what are you going to do to try and find out what the issue is? It could be an adulteration, it could be a poor, poor batch, it could be many different things, it could be a, a heterogeneous batch. Um, so as a result of all that, we, we can do some really uh, fascinating insights around the spectra and the libraries of spectra that are built up around a product or a product family. So uh, does that make sense so far, Steve? Yes, very much. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, where Chemometric Brain fits in the supply chain and uh, and how quality and safety are assured. Um, so we, we see Chemometric Brain fitting right across the the, the the supply chain. So what we can do is we can we can build a, a digital model of a product um, and, and using a qualitative modeling, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. And with that confidence area, that definition of that product in a digital way. Customers uh, can determine whether a batch coming in fits with that, with that, with that math mathematical model and confirm it's a good batch. Conversely, suppliers can share their, their library, their model with a customer and say, you know, we will, we will supply to this standard, this, this digital standard, and issue a certificate. And as a result, you get a, a, a sort of handshake, if you like, between a supplier and a customer. So you get a digital confirmation that this, the, what's being sent is good, what's arrived is good, and it, so it reduces both the need for uh, sampling uh, in, in the lab and also uh, reduces any disputes that may occur. Okay. Um, uh, your next slide, please, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think we perhaps covered some of this already. Um, you know, we can look at anything, a powder, gel, liquid, um, sites can be, uh, samples can be rejected or, 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 or uh, qualified. Um, there's this, this, this new level of, of quality control uh, complements something like, uh, like blockchain. It adds another custody record to a blockchain record if that's important to people. Um, but it applies, applies complete transparency at the physical chemical level as to what's being shipped 
and you could also use it potentially to define requirements if you're a, a food if you're buying food ingredients you can publish your your requirements in a digital model so anyone who can who can supply within this 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 to this uh, digital certificate is a potential supplier so you know you're reducing your risk on, on what you're potentially purchasing as well uh, food adulteration and, is uh, is a big topic in the news these days it often involves uh, very small amounts of an adulterant so uh, tell us a little bit about how chemometric brain can address food adulteration. Indeed. So, so let, let's just go on to the next slide. So here's a, here's an example of, of uh, you know, based on, on what happened in China a few years ago now when baby milk was being adulterated. Um, so we, we've got thousands of samples of, of, um, of milk protein concentrates. It's, it's used within Blend Hub on a very regular basis. And you can see uh, on the on the x y graph we have a confidence region that we as we call it this is the mathemat mathematical model that defines what what a good sample is uh, takes into account the acceptable natural variation in a product um, and, and what we decided to do was to, was to start to adulterate this with with, with a, another product which is chemically very very similar to see if we could determine uh, very low levels of adulteration Obviously, the closer the, chemically, the closer the product, the, the adulterant is, the harder it is to detect. So, on this basis, we, we started adulterating it with sweet whey powder. Um, and you know, there's the, a the dot in, in, the, in those circles, uh, the grey circles, at one percent, two percent, five percent, and ten percent. Um, so, for something chemically very similar, we can identify the adulterant. Um, if it's chemically quite different, we can determine much, much lower levels. And as we'll see a bit later on we can predict potential adulterants as well uh, in a sort of non-targeted way, which I think is, is becoming very topical in the world of food safety today, all based on this digital fingerprint that we created from the spectra. Okay. I understand that uh, su supplier management is uh, one, of the, one of the big features of uh, chemometric brain. Mm -hmm. Give us an example of uh, how, how the chemometric brain can be used to monitor the quality of supplied goods. So this is really interesting because especially in times of we're living in today with COVID where you know flexibility in supply chain can be really important and understandably uh, organizations are reluctant to, 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 to change suppliers because we know that the what's on the certificate of analysis doesn't necessarily give you the, the certainty around how a product's going to behave in a manufacturing line. So again based on real data uh, we have data from five different um, suppliers of WPC um, and we can create technically different classes of data within it within an analysis. Um, and, and what we can see here is, and again, this is real data. This is this isn't made up or anything. Um, we have five different suppliers of the same product, and you can see the, the very different confidence areas for the different suppliers. The one in green has a the, the, obviously the broadest range of variability, and the one in sort of orange in the middle has has the, the smallest. So, if for example, if you're if you're a food company and you want to go and audit your suppliers this is one thing you may do to start to, to decide who you're going to audit first you might audit the green company first because they have perhaps less control over their manufacturing than, than than the orange company the other thing and this is again this is real data the two at the bottom the two sort of orangey uh pinky color circles that overlap they um they, they actually were bought through different distrib different distributors but we determined they're actually the same manufacturer so by doing this, you get more insight onto, onto the, the controls that you can put around your suppliers to get more consistency um, and understand where there's variability. By the way, these may all be perfectly good suppliers. There's not, I'm not suggesting that they're bad suppliers, but you can get a better handle on, on how they're performing. Okay. Um, uh, blending and uh, blending is a big application for you, of course. And, and then the related uh, question of shelf life, uh, how how products might change in time as they're unused. How can uh, chemometric brain uh, address that issue? So, so obviously we come from a powder blending background. Um, oh, there's a slide missing. Um, so we come from a powder blending background, and what we can do is we can we can take samples at different different uh, depths and different times in a blend to determine. The homogeneity of a batch this could be a liquid or a gel or a powder it doesn't really matter um, and, um, and and take over sample every two minutes and determine the optimum time to get a homogeneous blend and what we found time and time again this is all the great work that Beatrice has been doing is blending for longer isn't necessarily a good thing you've become 
more uh, heterogeneous over time. Um, so, so um, yeah, that, that, that's a bit of an issue. Now, the example on the screen here um, is actually, I think, is a mixture of two slides. Um, with, with the, anyway, so ignore the um, the, the title. What, what, what this, the, the, the graph in the middle shows, the diagram in the middle, is, is actually a, a, a sampling over, over time. So bear in mind, what we're looking at is the physical chemical characteristics of a product um, uh, at, at, at the simplest level. So what we can do is we can, look, we can take the a, a, a spectra of the same sample over time and um, see how it changes. Now, what we've done in this particular case is we've built um, a confidence region for a particular product, and you can see the samples in there, and they're all good samples. But two years later, we go back to the same sample, and we can determine that this product, this sample, now falls outside the confidence region. Therefore, perhaps it suggests it's, it's, it's shelf, it's beyond its shelf life. Having said that, once you start to, to analyze, you can say actually, if, for other reasons, other say wet lab reasons, we should include this sample in our in our model because we know it's still performing to the right, it has the right functional characteristics. So maybe we expand our model slightly. And therefore, we can expand our shelf life uh, to determine that over, over time. So that, that gives you a, another insight as to how your products are behaving. You could also do this with um, things like um, uh, fruit juice concentrates and things. And, and we, you know, one of our customers uses this to, to as they're getting batches of concentrated fruit in, in, at the end of the season, uh, before, you know, and it's going to be stored for a few months, they're sampling it to determine how the, 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 the different batches are, are changing over time. They can, they can do taste, obviously, and they can do smell and, and, and color, whatever, but this gives them a much, much tighter control that maybe some batches are, de are degrading faster than others, therefore they change the, the sequence in which they, they use the, these different batches in their manufacturing lines. Okay? Uh, give, us, uh, give, uh, give our audience uh, an example, a uh, specific exam example of quantitative and qualitative analysis. Yeah. So, so here we've got an example where we've uh, we did a lot of work around things like cheese, um, and and when you start to blend the, the, both the quantitative and the qualitative analysis, and you'll see a bit this from from Beatrice a little bit later on, um, it becomes really quite interesting because you can get a much much better control over your your manufacturing line, uh, for example. So um, you know a, a scan takes two seconds to run, and you get you get the results back from Chemetric Brain in two or three seconds. As you'll see in a moment, so we can absolutely predict the, 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 all the traditional quantitative values, as you can see on there. And when you start to blend this with a with a um, the qualitative models as well, you can start to, to differentiate different types of, for example, mozzarella, as you'll see a bit later on in, in the demo, to give you much much tighter control than you would ever get with a quantitative model. Obviously, the quantitative results are important, um, but the qualitative model, when you complement it with that, gives you a much much tighter control and much greater insight as to exactly, for example, how your manufacturing lines are, are, are developing if you're stretching and heating mozzarella, for example, um, and, and gives you a lot more confidence that you're going to produce the right product at the end of the day. Okay. NIR spectroscopy um, is generally, um, it has some limitations on the, the level of the concentration. For low concentrations, sometimes NIR spectroscopy uh, is not as good as other methods. But I understand mm -hmm. your AI and machine learning algorithms have uh, have really pushed the boundary on that. Yes. Yeah, so, so what we've been doing, and again, it's all called through Beatrice's fantastic work, is we we've, we've, we've started using machine learning to to determine what the final ingredients of a product are. So in this particular case, we've, we've changed the vitamin names, but it's, it's A1, B, A, vitamin A, B1, B2, etc. So this particular company was was using uh, was making. Um, baby milk formulations. And you know they're only testing for particular vitamins fairly infrequently. They might test for vitamin C once a week. It's expensive, it's time consuming. They want to get the batches out the, out the door um, and obviously get the revenue coming in. Um, so we, we use the machine learning algorithms to, based on a, a library of 70 samples, um, to, to start to predict or determine what the um, what the actual uh, composition of these things are. So you can see here on, on the first column, based on, on, on the expected value, this is what they, they based on what they were putting into the blend, uh, what the expected value should be. Um, and then we, we obviously run all the analytics and the, and the machine learning, and, and these are the results that we were getting out of it. So you can see there's a very, very tight correlation, a very low error rate from the machine learning that we're getting. So it gives you a, a, a high degree of certainty, and you can do this, given this takes just a few seconds to run, Batch by batch by batch, 
and uh, even a cross of that to see if it's homogenous, uh, the composition is exactly right, um, and it matches up against the, 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 both the product specification and even the label on the product. Um, and this can, of course, could be shared with, with, with a, a customer as well, if appropriate. So I think this is one area where, you know, same constant stream of innovation that we deliver through our cloud platform. This is one area I think there'll be a lot more on, and uh, and it's 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 really exciting to get to levels of of um, analysis perhaps that you wouldn't expect from a, a near machine. Yeah, so I think we're very proud of this 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 is uh, this work. Earlier, you were talking a little bit about the um, the security of the food supply chain and uh, and uh, the the uh, opportunity to manage that security digitally. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about how blend how uh, chemometric brain brain fits into that? So, so yeah, absolutely. So we we if you, if you think about the food supply chain, you know, there's lots of emergence of, of blockchain based solutions uh, to to give you uh, certification, for example. Um, what what these blockchain solutions don't typically do is is deter tell you what's exactly in a product that's being shipped. They'll, they'll talk about the, the, where it was grown, where it was shipped to, where it was you know, where it was manufactured, or whatever. So they describe the product, but they don't tell you what's in it itself. So what we what we've done and what we're doing is is saying, well, we, we've got a we can issue a certificate for each batch against against a, a, a model, and and that can go in, into your blockchain record, or you don't need blockchain to do this. You can share it between supplier and a customer. Uh, to do, so the, the customer knows exactly what they're getting to a much, much tighter level of granularity than perhaps they had before. Um, and the supplier knows there's going to be less of a dispute it should, should any, any issues arise because they can prove what was shipped was in line with, with this, the, the physical chemical characteristics of a specification. So you can, you can use this at many different points in the food supply chain. Uh, we've got customers who are already using our digital certificates who want to, for example, be pre-qualified for a customer, they can prove um, in product food categories which are known for adulteration, that they can prove they have a good quality product and they will supply against that standard that they've already published. So it gives perhaps smaller companies uh, the opportunity to, to, to compete with much bigger companies. Uh, and of course, the, the beauty of this, by the way, is the way we've, we've structured it and we've priced it is, is this is um, to allow um, the, the adoption, widespread adoption through supply chains to, to democratize the use of both near infrared and, and from our perspective, the, the analytics behind uh, chemometrics so that um, smaller companies uh, can adopt it much more readily. Okay. Very good. Uh, I think at this point, uh, we're going to switch over to Beatrice for uh, a live demo, yes? So I'll just talk to uh, Beatrice. All right. Okay, Beatrice. Uh, yes, it's okay. Can you see right. my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to show you what chemometry brain is. Uh, this is the software is in a website address where you can enter with a username and a password and depending on your access you are able to see a different part of different or do different analysis and so in the main screen is a spectra viewer is something that all software have. Um, here you can look for the software that, uh, uh, sorry, you can look for the spectra that you want. And uh, all the spectra are in a database. And for each company, uh, there are different equipment and you can see by equipment or by product name or by different type of filters so for example we have all these uh, spectra uh, got in different uh, site with different equipment and if you want to see some of them you only have to click on load selection and uh, you can see the spectra. Sorry. You can view 
all of them. Um, the ball uh, line chain, depending on which spectra you are selecting. Here you can play with them, do different pretreatment and so on. But the interesting part is when you move to sample validation. And here is the part of the section that the quality control user uh, works. So when click in this green cloud, for example, if the, in the factory we receive uh, some wargam, you only have to select the modern name, look for the sample that you have measured, filter, and select them and validate the sample. And uh, you will have the resource regarding these samples. So in this case, the free batches are conforming or they are inside the, the confident area and comply with all the all the parameter uh, need in order to have a conforming product. Now I'm going to show you a real case about an energy blend that we have with a customer some months ago. You can you have to select the sample. In this case, we have to do to this sample. This is the measurement that the customer took uh, from one batch, and all of them were not conforming. So when the customer review the um, the production, and so that uh, some ingredient could be missing. So the customer made some sample adding to this batch. Sorry. And the possible uh, missing ingredient. In this case, they um, might be taurine, marto string, or a blend of both. So when you validate uh, the sample, you can see that the sample with marto string are farther from the mother, as we can see here. The sample that contain marto string and taurine and closer, and those that contains only taurine are uh, right. So in a few hours, the customer could fix the production, adding taurine to the to the batch. And once uh, knew that the taurine was the ingredient, the missing ingredient they reprocess it. The batch, and we have here the spectra reprocess it, and you can see as all the spectra from the new batch are conforming. So that offer to the customer a new possibility um, a safe of time because the customer don't have to send the sample to any lab in order to do a chromatography uh, analysis. Uh, another possibility that we have is when you have um, products that are very similar among them and you want to discriminate between them. So in this case, we have this five samples of mozzarella, and if we validate them, we can see that each sample uh, belong to one class. Um, this, uh, this one is not conforming, and the other ones are classified according to their type. So that is an important tool uh, for a company and also a unique uh, 
functionality that chemometric brain has is the possibility to get the ingredient and the percentages of uh, a blend of ingredients. In this case, um, we are going to look for this equipment and choose uh, two stabilizers, one from cheese and another for yogurt. And these are uh, compound of different ingredients. And when we click in this button, uh, the algorithm is looking for a spectra similar to those one. And the algorithm is trained with thousands and thousands of spectra and concentration of these ingredients and is able to give us uh, the composition of each stabilizer and their proportion. So we have a unique solution in order to know the composition of an unknown sample. Um, move on to the quantitative analysis. Uh, we have also here the possibility of measurement, measure the uh, physical chemical properties of any sample. For this case, uh, we can uh, do fat in mozzarella. And um, the good things is that you don't need to unlock the calibration because uh, each time you want to predict the calibration is done with all the samples that you have in the database with reference values. So uh, we have here the validation, the external validation resource, and we can now predict the sample that we, we have. In this case, we are going to look for mozzarella samples choose some of them and predict them, getting the values for fat in these batches. So we have uh, in one side the quantitative um, analysis, in another part the certification that the sample are similar to those manufactured before or to those received uh, in the factory before. And we are also able to get the ingredient analysis of a powder uh, brand. So um, that is uh, something that helps to the companies in order to ensure the, the food safety. Okay. So it's all. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Beatrice. Very powerful software. Uh, Jeff, I think I'll invite you to uh, uh, wrap up with a with a summary of the features, functions, and benefits of uh, your offering. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I think hopefully what we've shown you is a, is a pretty comprehensive way of taking uh, spectra and analyzing it in many different ways that perhaps you hadn't thought of before. Uh, particularly the qualitative models and how you can start to share information across the supply chain, but even using it within your organization to give you much tighter control. Um, you know, this will result in, in, for example, goods coming into the warehouse. You can have someone in the, in, the, um, in the warehouse with relatively little training to do a scan and get the results on, a, on a, a, an iPad or an iPhone or whatever. So it goes straight into production or into quarantine rather than everything being going into QC before it can be released. So there's, there's a saving there in terms of, um, of working capital, for example, um, and, and space saving in the, in the warehouse, if that's important. Um, but you also save money on, um, on QA lab tests. You know, once, we, once you've got the right sample set or uh, the right library, then you can really minimize the, the, a lot of the, the Q, Q, QC lab testing that you've been doing in the past. So there's a big saving there. And I think ultimately, though, it's about building confidence between suppliers and customers so that you can um, you get more transparency about what the requirement is, 
from a, cust a customer who can publish a requirement, a mathematical model, say, this is what I'm after, send us a sample, or, or if you've got a device, scan it, and if it matches the, the, the confidence region, we'll consider you as a supplier. And that gives you, so it gives you more flexibility, you've got more certainty, that that product will behave in a particular way in your, in your, uh, in your facility. Um, so then it comes obviously discussion around availability and price and all the other important things. So I think overall, um, you know, it's, it's a very uh, robust platform. It's well proven over a number of years, um, and now it's available to um, to anyone in the food the food industry. Very good, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we'll pass the baton back to uh, Emiliano, and we'll have our uh, Q and A session. Yes, uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Beatrice. Uh, for the for the nice presentation and for the nice demonstration, we have a couple of uh, of of, um, of interesting question. But before uh, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what can be in your uh, vision the advantage of everything, all the information in the cloud instead of having something uh, uh, stationary on a computer? Well, that, that's really important. If, if you think about um, if you're if you're a company of any size, you know. You wouldn't treat finance on a on a site by site basis or a laptop by laptop basis. You know, you put in SAP or Oracle or whatever. But the same that doesn't necessarily apply at the moment to quality control. You know, you're doing it on a laptop by laptop basis. You build a model, you might share the model, you might share data, but it doesn't it simply doesn't scale. So if you're a, a a company with multiple sites, multiple devices, you can now consolidate it all into one platform. And if you say you've got the same raw ingredients coming into different factories. You get oversight on everything that's going on. Uh, you can you can see what's rejected, what's accepted, whether the libraries are robust enough, or whether you have to redefine a library because it's a new season or whatever the product you're buying. Um, so it gives you a kind of enterprise level control around what's coming into your factories, potentially what's happening within the factory, and and what's being shipped out, and then shared with the customer, of course. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, another question is, uh, um, do you have any experience of milk adulteration, especially urea or similar products? Beatrice, do you want to? Yes. Uh, yes, we have um, experience with adulteration. But uh, in that case, uh, we need to ensure that the um, sample that you consider as good, as good sample, and with the qualitative uh, method, you can determine the urea contamination in the in the samples. Yes. Do you uh, see more possible a quantification or a qualification? Yes. I think. The qualification, of course. Uh, with the quantification, maybe you 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 don't see it. You see the same value of protein. And uh, I have also a couple of questions regarding the concentration. Uh, I know that uh, for NIR guys, this is a, always a, a painful question. Uh, what about the detention limit? Uh, because we have a question that uh, we saw uh, vitamin zero point. Uh, one and something percent. Um, can you comment uh, such a detention limit, Beatrice? Uh, I was surprised uh, when I got this resource. Okay, I I also was surprised. But uh, the thing is that uh, you fit to the algorithm with a lot of samples, with a lot of information. You have. Uh, different um, blend with different ingredients and the same ingredient um, participate in different um, blend. So at the end, you have a lot of information to combine and to be able of uh, getting this resource. The resource are, are true, okay? But just to add, yeah. it's we, just we, the, we... the algorithm, yes. Yes, so what we've been doing as well is looking at other um, areas of adulteration, which um, are very topical. So we've done some a fair bit of work, for example, with olive oil um, origin, identify, how we identify the origin of olive oil. So we've worked with, I think, just 70 or 80 samples from different countries, and we can consistently um, distinguish and differentiate between olive oils from Spain, from Portugal, from Turkey, from from 
Spain. I think the Italian olive oil has proved to be a bit of a tricky challenge, uh, Emiliano. But um, but we're, we're getting down to a, a, a good level of confidence that we can distinguish origin as well. Yeah, yeah. An another interesting question. Uh, um, you uh, made a lot of principal component uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, we are used to see an ellipsoid around the center of the class. Uh, how do you define the polyno polynomial uh, shape around the, 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 the class? We use a convex hull. That is the, the minimum volume that contains all the sample inside the, that volume in the, in, a, in the space of N component. Okay. Okay, that's that 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 that's that's a really a good one. Um, mm -hmm. What this is a question that is really I really mind to this kind of question. How do you compare, let's say, blending online versus blending at line or better? We are normally uh, working on tumble blender with the PATW and we try to work with principal component following the PC1 versus the time, or simple is the better. Uh, let's say we try to uh, let's say use moving block standard deviation. You are working with a, a PCA, uh, basically. Uh, what do you think about PCA, the final stage, or a moving block online during the blending evolution? Both have uh, the pros and the cons. Uh, we usually use the uh, at, um, who is, uh, the inline um, analysis, uh, but using PCAs. Uh, we trust at the moment more in the PCAs and in the homogeneity that the PCA can give us that in the moving block regarding about all uh, the the component the minority uh, the component that are uh, minoritaries you know the the minor ing the minor ingredient that yeah. is a critical thing that the moving block uh, we are not sure that uh, ensure okay yeah uh, another question, this is more for, uh, uh, for, for, for Jeff. Um, is the software available on the web? Uh, that's uh, more a commercial thing. So, so, so. Your software, what should I do? I think uh, that this is the interpretation of the question. <laughs> So I mean, it's, it's, it's available on the web. It's a subscription, depending on different, different levels of license you can get for an end user, a manager, or a chemistrician. If you want to build your own libraries and models, um, and you just, you know, we put a commercial agreement in place, and we provide the, the URL and the registration details. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure, obviously, you've got the, you've got the right uh, devices, and we can migrate old data from transference uh, transference modules so you want to migrate your old data to a, to, to the same uh, definition as, as the, the viavi data produces we can do that as well uh, i don't know if you saw that there's a transference module at the bottom of the screen um, that paper showed um and it's online training it, it's 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 you can you know, we can set you up in a day it, it's, it's really not a challenge um, just can it be run on a on a customer server well, our default is to, to, to run it in our secure cloud. Um, you know, we, we, we update it, we maintain it. Uh, you're very welcome to look at our security profiles. You know, we have two-factor authentication. Um, it's a very robust um, cloud platform. At the moment, we haven't we haven't considered putting it into a customer's data center. Um, if that was a very specific requirement, we might look at it. Um, but having come from places that I used to work at Oracle, for example, on-premise cloud solutions can be can be challenging, but need to be well thought through in terms of support and upgrades because we're regularly upgrading the the, uh, the platform. So if that's a particular discussion, we're ha happy to have it. I swear that is not my question. Uh, is possible to control the Micronir with your software and uh, is an app for mobile phone available? <laughs> 
It's possible to control. Uh, at the moment, we have an application in a local computer, in a local tablet, but um, we are building an, an app in order to use uh, an app with Micronir as soon as possible. Okay, and what's interesting, by the way, is we, you know, to try and steal some of Beatrice's uh, insights here, is you know, we can load, load the, the models onto your iPhone or whatever, and, and we can produce the results without connectivity to, to the internet. So it'll all be done on, on the uh, let, let me say that the app is the sweet part uh, of uh, all the bulky job that was done by Beatrice to create the <laughs> Clearly, it's the funny side. Uh, the, the, the other question, this is more for you, Beatrice. Uh, uh, how do you compare artificial intelligence with the principal component analysis of PLS? How do you compare artificial intelligence with the classical uh, chemometric algorithm? And uh, uh, I saw that you are doing a composition, chemical composition of uh, a specific product. Are you using artificial intelligence in that case? For classification, not at the moment, but uh, only for composition. Yes. But it's very powerful, uh, in fact. Yes. So in that case, in the example, the one that you shared uh, before the PLS, the traditional PS, you are using artificial intelligence. Yes. In yes. Okay. In order to determine the, the composition of a blend, and uh, we use artificial intelligence. Yes. Uh, another question is, uh, does machine learning help in getting a better qualitative and quantitative model? In fact, all the quantitative or qualitative model can be considered mature learning. But um, with lower amount of sample than normal, uh, uh, we have good resource when we have around 40 sample or more, but depends on each case, on each uh, product. Uh, we have to try. There is no uh, magical number. Yes. Another question. Is possible to add the geolocalization into the um, data information? I can answer yes quickly to this question. Yes. because. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a basic one, and you can probably also in, in the back end have a mapping of the or where the measurements are done. Yes. Uh, this, this is a more technical question. Can this technique applied to potato crops to identify chemical compound of phytosanitary product in the yes. if, if you are talking about pesticides, uh, no. Is no that is not the technique in order to identify the pesticide. Because the we are talking about another contamination, yes, problem, but no pesticide. Uh, what about the method transfer? If, if you have a, a, a instrument for a competitor, yes. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Trans and and the, and this data are already in chemometric brain. When can I? How can I move it to the micron? Uh, we have a very easy tool in the software already um, at date. Um, we need uh, we need to measure the same sample thirty times. Uh, as minimum with one equipment and 30 times with the new one, with the Micronir. And doing that product by product uh, is possible a good, very good transfer, a very easy, uh, having all the spectra in the, in the database. Okay, another question. You have uh, shown us an example uh, where uh, you acquire a different batches and you create a model. What is going on? What is the reliability when, uh, uh, let's say, one of these component, uh, uh, one of these component changed, uh, for example, change. For example, uh, I have, uh, let's say, lactose from one supplier, but at a certain point, I am getting lactose from another supplier that was, uh, let's say, uh, not uh, present in the original calibration. Yes, uh, 
in that case, uh, you need to see uh, if the new sample with the new lactose or the new ingredients is inside the, the mother or no. If the new ingredients show any variability, but you accept this variability, uh, you have to update the, the mother in order to include this new variability. But uh, should be the, the user or should be the the owner of the formulation who has to admit this new variability and accept it. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me clarify a point because uh, um, we are getting uh, a, 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 a question. Uh, is PCA artificial intelligence? No, not at all. Actually, what Beatrice said is exactly in, in contraposition. Uh, PCA and PLS are traditional chemometric technology. Artificial intelligence is something else. And artificial intelligence is, uh, uh, let's say, deployed for uh, analyzing the chemical composition, but not for uh, blending or qualitative analysis. Is it correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. So I think that. Uh, we are uh, at 5 p.m., so uh, we will check uh, better all the questions uh, later on, and we will try to reply to all the possible uh, uh, questions in written if we have not yet uh, properly replied uh, during the live session. Um, I would like to say thank you to Beatrice, to Jeff, and to Steve for, uh, for, uh, for this presentation. And uh, um, I'm really uh, happy about uh, the interview that uh, uh, we, we made. And uh, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. If you need uh, any kind of information, you can contact uh, uh, me, Steve, or uh, uh, Beatrice and Jeff. And we will try to reply in the, in the best possible uh, uh, way. Thank you very much for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.